Hello, everybody. Welcome to Beersmith Podcast number 91. It's been November 2014, and John Blickman joins us today to discuss brewing equipment. A quick note that I launched the How to Brew All Grain video along with the extract video I've been talking about for months now. You can get your copy or watch the trailer by going to beersmith.com slash DVD. Also, I'd like to thank this week's sponsor, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They're now offering a full six issues per year, up from four at the same discount price. In addition, you can get another 20% off your subscription when you use the offer code BEERSMITH at checkout. I encourage you to get this magazine today uh, from beerandbrewing.com. Use the offer code BEERSMITH to get your 20% discount today. And finally, I want to mention the American Homebrewers Association 2014 gift card program. Give the gift of an AHA membership to a fellow brewer. They're running a special now through December 31st, where you receive a free book or one of my videos when you order your gift card. To find out more, go to homebrewersassociation.org slash membership and click on the gift membership link. Again, that's homebrewersassociation.org slash membership and click on the gift membership link. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, my guest is John Blickman, the head of Blickman Engineering, a company that makes some of the nicest world-class homebrewing equipment in the world. You can find them online at Blickman Engineering, that's B-L-I-C-H-M-A-N-N, two N's that is, engineering.com, and in most major brewing retail stores. John joined us once before on podcast number 28. John, it's uh, fantastic to have you on the show. Great to be back on, Brad. So uh, how you been doing? I, I I think you've been growing by leaps and bounds lately, haven't you? Yes, growth has been good. Uh, the craft uh, craft brew business and the home brew business uh, just kind of go hand in hand, and it's uh, it's been a wild ride and uh, an enjoyable one. So uh, we're going to talk a little about equipment today, and I thought we might start with uh, the basic three tier system that people use for home brewing. Uh, most of us use some kind of a three tier system. Can you start by describing what that is? Yes, that's the system that uh, uh, anybody that all grain brewed when I first started brewing in the early nineties uh, was using. And, you know, it's called a, a three tier or a fly sparging is, is another uh, thing that you'll hear. And it, it's a very common system these days. Uh, started, I believe, in, in Germany, I think, uh, many, many years ago. But it basically has a, uh, a hot liquor tank, a mash ton or a mash louder ton, and a uh, boil kettle. And uh, quite simply, you, uh, uh, you mash into your uh, mash ton when you're uh, through your mashing. Mm -hmm. uh, you use the uh, liquid in the hot liquor tank to rinse the uh, wort out of the grains and into your boil kettle. And it's uh, uh, typically done over a period of about 45 minutes to an hour to get a real efficient sparge or uh, mm -hmm. uh, rinsing of those grains. And uh, that does add some time. And then you will, before you start your uh, uh, sparging, you'll want to uh, boil off or recirculate uh, that mash to set it to kind of set the filter bed in there to clarify the wort, and uh, that usually takes about oh ten minutes, and then you begin your sparge, and forty five minutes to an hour later you're you're done with that into your boil kettle and and ready to brew. Now you sell a lot of nice kettles uh, in various different sizes. Uh, can you tell us about the boiler maker? Yes, the boiler maker. We just actually released the uh, G two boiler maker. Um, we had uh, just a we're the first that really designed a brew pot, a brew kettle for uh, home brewers. And uh, before that, it was mostly repurposed commercial kitchen uh, uh, kettles. Um, and it was the, uh, the first for the built-in uh, level gauge, uh, glass level gauge. It uh, has a unique stepped bottom so that we could rest a false bottom on it. Uh, that was just a, a, a great uh, way to seal that so you don't have what they call shunting or bypassing of the of the grains. Mm -hmm. um, had a very unique three piece ball valve uh, that uh, we were some of the one of the first to use uh, that can be disassembled and and cleaned. Uh, and we had a unique dip tube that you could remove uh, without tools. So there's a, a few uh, different things that we did on our our brew pots. We even oriented the handles. Uh, differently than what most brew kettles do and most mm -hmm. of that is so when you're carrying it you're not whacking yourself in the jimmy with the ball valve <laughs> so i mean just those simple things yeah. that we try to uh, i think you can see it here yeah this is the new one right yeah 
Yeah, so that's the G2, and and we built the, the G1 for many, many years. It became kind of the gold standard of, of brew kettles. Uh, but we're, we're always looking to improve things, so we added some uh, uh, cool touch handles that make it a lot more comfortable to hold, particularly uh, if it's hot. Um, same thing with the, uh, the lid. Uh, but the biggest change is we've gone to a, um, a single-piece U.S.-made construction. Uh, there's no welds. It starts as a single sheet, goes through a, an impressive uh, uh, press with some dyes, and pops out as a pot. Wow. Um, so it's, it's you, you uh, make them right there in the factory. Uh, we have a, a company here in the states make them for us. Uh, we had to have all special dyes made for that. It was a pretty significant investment in those tools, but um, you know it's one that we we wanted a no sacrifice pot to take that next step up, and we are just thrilled with the quality of it. Um, the finish we've moved to a, a brushed uh, finish on the outside and a satin finish on the inside. That's really easy to clean, and uh, if you're like. Uh, us unfortunate Hoosiers. We've got the best limestone in the world. It's used to make most of the monuments in Washington, D.C., but unfortunately, it also makes extremely hard water. So it's a, um, this brush finish, you know, ten, it hides fingerprints, it hides water stains, and it just looks nice, uh, you know, for many, many years. Um, so we, we've continued with the, uh, the neat features in it, that step to bottom. Uh, the glass level gauge is, is uh, the same, and the handle orientation is the same. Same great accessories that fit in there. In fact, um, uh, all but the 15-gallon uh, false bottom uh, fits in uh, the G1 to G2 are all interchangeable. Um, and then one other thing that we really wanted to add was a different uh, valve, and, and that's what we call our linear flow valve. And it does a couple of really neat things. Um, one, um, it's really easy to adjust the flow. It uses a, a more of a, uh, a globe valve type style, so you, you unscrew it, uh, kind of like a, a hose bib on, on your house. Um, but it's got a unique mm -hmm. shape that makes the flow out of it very linear and easy to control. This is great for uh, uh, if you're trying to flow control for loudering, for um, uh, running through a chiller, those sort of things. Um, obviously, it also has on-off uh, capability. But the other thing that we uh, liked about it is we put a 90-degree configuration in it so that it reduces hose kinking. So you can orient it in any outlet position, down, oh, up, sideways, yeah. left, right. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so it you know it eliminates fittings, and, and it just uh, uh, has a real nice um, uh, install-friendly uh, uh, design. Um, we also put a silicone grip on it. I hated the fact that uh, the those the vinyl grips tend to uh, melt, and and then you end up with a metal handle that's kind of hard to to turn when it's hot. So we have a silicone grip that won't melt, so it's real easy, cool to the touch. Mm -hmm. um, and the last thing that I really like about it, although it's on the hot side, I still just like to have the valve clean, so I don't have uh, you know wort that's inside that valve pocket just kind of getting nasty so this thing comes apart in seconds uh for cleaning and you can just spray it out and uh and reinstall it it's just been a you know we uh had all the castings uh special made for us so that we could have a no sacrifice valve that's just perfect for a uh, homebrew kettle now you can configure these uh, as a mash tun as a hot liquor tank or as a boiler right yeah, absolutely. That's uh, and that's true with the the G1 and the G2. We really set it up uh, so that the the basic pot is all the same, the basic kettle is all the same. All you need to do is add in a false bottom. We have a patented uh, button louver false bottom that is extremely resistant to plugging, very easy to clean compared to a perforated false bottom. That makes it into a mash tun. Um, the hot liquor tank you just use as is, and the boil kettle. Uh, we for pellet hops we have our um, our hop blocker that that works great for pellet hops. And what sizes do you have? I know you you support everything from the home brewer all the way up, right? Yes, yes, we have uh, seven and a half, ten, fifteen, twenty, thirty, fifty-five, and hundred gallon sizes. Hundred <laughs> gallons, huh? Yeah, that's actually <laughs> very unique. We we have an extension that uh, has an O-ring seal on it, and you just slip it over the top of your fifty-five gallon kettle, and uh, it doubles capacity almost. So. Uh, that's been very popular for some of our small commercial breweries who want to uh, increase their brew house capacity very economically and very quickly. So that's, uh, that's also patent pending. So we, we try to um, have these things that are really tailored towards uh, the user 
as opposed to uh, repurposed uh, existing uh, stuff out there. A lot of times that, you know, the existing stuff out there is perfectly suitable, but if it's not, uh, we're not afraid to dig in and make something that works uh, flawlessly for the, for the user. So um, one of the things you need to do when you go to all grain, of course, is buy a burner because uh, uh, usually the stove doesn't work that well, right? Right. You know, five gallon batches, for the most part, you can get by with it if you've got a, a, a pretty high powered stove. But really to get that uh, a full rolling boil that's going to drive off the DMS and uh, isomerize those uh, delicious alpha acids, you really need a good solid rolling boil. And it's really kind of hard to do that on a stove. Top. Yeah, I've got a sort of a high end stove, but it runs maybe 15,000 BTUs, whereas a typical propane's what, John? Oh, uh, like a, a, a typical uh, home burner would be uh, seven, 8,000 BTU, probably something like that. Right. But I'm talking about a typical oh, propane big, burner that oh, you'd use outside. Ours runs at 72,000 BTU. Right. 72,000. So uh, yeah. <laughs> and then a lot of people are going electric uh, as well. And I noticed you have some new electric heaters. Yes, we do. Um, I, I brewed outside and, uh, when I first got going and, uh, it gets a little chilly in, in, uh, Indiana, not, not as cold as where you're at probably, but, uh, still not the most pleasant thing to brew, uh, outside or even in a, in a garage. Um, so, uh, we, and we just had a lot of people that wanted to brew inside. I wanted to move inside. And, uh, so we developed, uh, an electric, uh, immersion heating element, uh, that we call the boil coil. And, uh, it, we released it around August, I think, and, uh, it's been selling very well. It's, uh, we're real happy with that product. And again, this was one that was designed specifically for home brewers in mind, instead of a, a repurposed water heater element. Um, this is a, a, a complete stainless steel version that has a real nice, um, uh, connection to the pot that just requires you to drill two small holes versus a very large hole and weld in a fitting or, or kind of try to, uh, make up uh, a uh, wellless connection. And uh, the really nice thing about it is it has a plug that you can just plug in and plug out. And, you know, so you can move it for cleaning and you can, you know, it's spray down cables. Uh, you don't have to worry about getting your electrical connections wet. Uh, and uh, so is, that a, is that a 220 system? I'm just looking at the plug there. Yeah, we have for the hundred or for the 10 gallon setup or 10 gallon pot size and down, we have a uh, 120 volt and a 240 volt version. Mm -hmm. Uh, the 120 volt version gets the job done, um, but the the 240 really gives you a nice uh, full rolling boil that equals anything you'd get with a burner. So um, you know if 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 you have the 240 volt available, that's uh, that's always a better way to go. If you don't, um, we do have it for the smaller batch sizes. Uh, you know, for the five gallon batch size, you know, the well, you can always just un unplug your uh, your dryer or something, you know. Yes, that's uh, that's a, a definitely uh, a great source of uh, power for in your house, particularly for apartment brewers. And we do sell adapter cables for um, almost all of the dryer and stove plugs. So uh, you know we've got it. So it's plug and play. If you're not an electrician, we've got um, all the. It's all pre-wired and it has all the connections and everything. It's just plug it in and go. Now, do you have to worry about scorching with a heater? Is the heating element come in direct contact with the wort? Uh, the answer to that is yes and no. On a properly designed system, no. On a, um, a repurposed system, you have to really be careful that your watt density is low enough. And watt density is how many watts of power per square inch of um, heater surface area you have. And you know if you're uh, in, in that uh, you know 50 watts per square inch, you're probably okay. We're down in the I believe. Uh, the 30s, and um, I think we have it published on our on our webpage. If I've got those numbers uh, wrong, but um, so it's not a big concern, I guess, right? It's, it really isn't. There's a lot of there's been a lot of concern over the years for it, and um, you know I think if you're if you've if you've been mindful of the watt density, you're going to be fine. And we've got ours ours. There's low watts and density, uh, and we're at the ultra low watt density. Uh, end of it you can actually dry fire our heaters without burning them up i think we're probably the only ones on the market that have that low um we don't mm -hmm. recommend that but uh you can it, it's it's no real uh more scorch risk than than using a propane burner on your stove Yeah, i've seen a number of small commercial brewers are going electric now too just to get around the you know having to install a hood system and all the ventilation and so on 
Yes, and that's you know a couple of the big benefits of electric is going indoors, and you know one you eliminate that uh, carbon monoxide risk. Uh, uh, the e even a really efficient uh, burner, you know, less than half of the heat energy goes into the pot; the rest goes into the atmosphere around it. So it's a lot more pleasant to brew because you don't have all that that extra heat, and and you, you have less than half the amount of ventilation. Uh, required. You're really just trying to get rid of steam and, and odor. That's that's really it. So, uh, and then you have the the safe, you know, less a little bit better safety because you don't have that open flame. So if you're doing commercial stuff, uh, sometimes the fire marshals uh, get their undies in a bunch about um, uh, the the big power uh, burners and trying to find some that you know meet the local codes and all that sort of thing. So, very cool. Um, well, John, I know a lot of people when they go uh, big or start going bigger with their brewing system, they have to start worrying about moving word around. And uh, they usually invest in some pumps to do that, which gets us into the realm of rims and herms. And I was wondering if you could tell folks a little bit about rims and herm systems. A lot of people may not be familiar with what those are. Oh, absolutely. Yes. There's um, uh, RIMS is, is an acronym for a recirculation infusion mash system. And essentially what that means is you're going to uh, draw wort from the bottom of your mash tun um, heat it and then return it to the top of your mash tun. And uh, some are intermittent where they recirculate just while you're heating, but most are continuous recirculation and you just add heat as needed. And you can add heat a couple ways. You can add it um, uh, direct fire with gas. Uh, and um, you know that would be on the, the bottom of the pot and you recirculate. That's how we do that with our gas-fired um, tower of power controller. So we just turn the burner on automatically as it uh, mm -hmm. as the controller decides it needs heat. Um, you can do it electrically with a uh, a rims uh, uh, heater, and that is essentially just an inline electric immersion heater, so that it it goes through, uh, it turns the electric heater on as it needs heat, and uh, returns that to the top of the mash. Mm -hmm. um, the The second uh, way, and this has been around for quite some time, is the Herms. And that's a, uh, just a slightly different way of adding the heat to that recirculated wort. Um, and that stands for uh, heat exchange recirculation mash system. Mm -hmm. uh, typically what's done is uh, you've got your hot liquor tank that's already available and warm. And you will put a... Uh, uh, heating coil inside of there. So just basically like a, it, it and it, in fact, many people do just use a uh, wort chiller, uh, very si similar to that. So you pump your wort uh, through the inside of this coil. It, uh, it goes through and it's sitting inside of that hot liquor, picks up heat and then returns it to the top of the mash. Um, that really came about because people were very concerned about scorching their work with these electric heating elements or gas heating elements. And with the, um, the heating elements that we have now and the control systems that we have now, it really is, it's not uh, a risk. It's, it's, it's been a concern, but I think uh, um, if you ask anybody that's been brewing with these uh, properly designed systems, uh, there's not a problem with them, and they are sim more simple to deal with than the, the Herm systems, which will typically require some sort of valving to turn them off and different things like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've got both the electric and the uh, gas-fired uh, rim systems, and both we've brewed uh, uh, Kolsch beers and Pilsner's very light-colored beers, and there's we've not experienced any uh, scorching. In fact, it's, you really have to try really, really hard to even try to scorch uh, with a properly designed system. So, so what are some of the advantages you have with a RIMS or HERM system once you've made the investment in uh, in uh, some pumps? One of the one of the things I like best about it is just that um, the the precision and the re repeatability. It's so easy just to set a temperature and it'll hold it within you know uh, less than a degree in in most systems. And you know while that's you know you're your uh, enzymes aren't calibrated quite that precisely. Um, it's that repeatability that's nice. It's that set it and forget it, uh, you know, so that you're not, you know, accidentally overshooting or you're involved in some other, you know, you're cleaning a fermenter, who knows what, and then you realize you're five degrees below a set point, you know, so it's, it's that. It also gives you some automated ramping capabilities so you can do um, step mashes uh, if you'd like, um, but, all in all, it's just a it's just a great way to have a repeatable uh, mash uh, day, which is great. And of course, the next thing you add after the pumps is a is a temperature controller. 
so you can control it uh, very precisely. And I know you guys uh, sell one. I think it's called the Tower of Power, right? Yes, mm -hmm. the, the Tower of Power. Uh, that's uh, uh, similar to some how uh, some of the others. We've we've got a gas fired one that will actually turn your burner on and off. But they all use uh, some uh, form of sensor, uh, whether it be a thermocouple or an RTD. Uh, or a thermistor. We use a, a platinum uh, RTD. They're um, it's a almost a lab grade. It's a class A lab grade, so they're very very accurate and uh, very stable. And then that feeds into a um, a device that uh, uh, reads that output and um, decides if uh, the the temperature is too uh, cold or uh, too warm. If it's too cold, it's going to uh, turn on a heater, turn on a pump, uh, uh, turn on, in the case of the gas-fired one, an ignition coil that's going to uh, ignite the, the burner. And, uh, and it adds the heat until it gets up to that uh, temperature, and then it uh, cuts the power, and, you know, and it will cycle. You know, so you know, electric systems may cycle once every five seconds, go through a, a cycle. Gas ones uh, may cycle every 20, 30 seconds, something like so that. It really makes that temperature control easy. You don't have to be guessing adding hot water or cold water or anything like that. Right, right. I remember the, the dark days running inside in a panic to grab some ice because I overshot the mash and, you know, or, uh, you know, just trying to get it heated back up and, and, uh, you know, really having to pay close attention to your mash to get it to, uh, just stabilize right where you want it. And, so the controller's uh, tied right into your heating elements and your pumps and everything, right? Right. Yeah. It's tied in. It's what turns, it's, it's the brains of the outfit. It, it's measuring the temperature and responding with either, uh, heat or no heat to maintain that temperature. And uh, it, with our systems, it's not a problem to maintain it within half a degree uh, Fahrenheit, a quarter degree Celsius. So it's, it's just nice knowing that you can, you know, you can, you know, I, if, if I'm doing just even a single uh, step infusion mash, I'll mash in um, at just a little bit under where I know I want to be. And, and then I'll use the, uh, the automated control to just glide it right in exactly to where I want and just maintain it for the rest of the mash. Uh, step mashes is great. Um, uh, some of them are programmable. Our, ours can be programmed just with, on your laptop where you can put you know, any number of steps in your mash profile if you want to do that. And it'll automatically run them right through. It's nice. Very cool. Well, I noticed you made a foray recently into compact brewing systems. Uh, you got a new system called the Brew Easy. How's how's that different from a typical three tier system? Um, well, the three tier system again is three tiers. It it has a hot liquor tank, uh, the mash tun, and the uh, boil kettle. And with the Brew Easy, it's it's really a two kettle system, and it eliminates uh, the sparge. It's kind of a hybrid between a uh, brew in a bag uh, mm -hmm. and a um, uh, a, a um, batch sparge, uh, but you just have one batch that you're sparging with. So you start with all of your hot liquor. The mash tun sits on top. The boil kettle sits on bottom, and uh, so you uh, uh, you're basically recirculating. This is a recirculation system. So you you uh, it, it's it's our standard mash tun and our standard brew kettle, and uh, you start. Uh, with all of your uh, brewing liquor, about half in the top, half in the bottom, and heat it up to the temperature that you need for your strike. Uh, put your uh, malt in and uh, continue to recirculate. So it's draining from the mash tun down into the brew kettle where it gets heated either with electric or gas uh, system, and then uh, back up to the mash. And uh, the nice thing about starting with all the hot liquor is, one, it, it virtually eliminates your your uh, scorch risk because you're really, you're you're uh, boiling at the same uh, specific gravity that um, your uh, your final uh, beer is going to be, uh, or your final uh, wort, since you're not diluting it afterwards. You're not mashing uh, concentrated mash. So you're running about anywhere between two and a half and three uh, quarts per pound uh, uh, mash uh, mm -hmm. to Grish ratio. Uh, so uh, the nice thing about this is since you're recirculating, it's it's already doing your Vorloff. It's already doing your clarification um, that you don't get with. So it just um, constantly recirculates, right? Is that right? Right, right. And you can do this manually if you, if you want, or you can automate it. And that's that's the other nice thing. And uh, uh, so you've already clarified it. I like it because when I'm getting close to the end of the mash, I can I can check my um, uh, uh, 
specific gravity and I can tell right away I'm I'm on or I'm off and I, I may just wait a little bit longer to make sure that I've uh, completely uh, converted. So I, I really like uh, that effect because you're not diluting it later. Uh, so uh, you, you really have that immediate feedback. And then you simply just let it, you know, when you're done, you just turn off the, um, the recirculation and mm -hmm. let all the work from the uh, mash drain into the brew kettle. And since it's uh, a little bit more diluted than normal, um, it actually increases the efficiency because you're le leaving uh, less sugar behind in that water that's absorbed into the grains. It's kind of similar um, to a br Bruna bag. You can get uh, very good efficiency for that same reason. Yeah. So uh, you get that, you get uh, just great work clarity and um, you're, you don't have anything to lift uh, like you would in a, in a Bruna bag, uh, which is uh, particularly helpful with the larger batches. And you just let that drain it virtually at full speed into the, uh, uh, the mash or into the boil kettle. So it's just a few minutes, uh, you know, pretty 10 minutes to, to get it all to drain. So you eliminate that whole sparging, vorloffing step, which is great with, the, uh, with a lot of the other uh, similar systems and uh, and then you just scoop the grains out and lift the mash ton off and you're in, and by the time you know you're done cleaning your uh, mash ton up it's up to a boil and and it's uh, brew like uh, regular but it's it's nice because it's very uh, compact you know so if you're a com apartment brewer or you just don't want to divert a, a lot of space to your um, to your brewery um, it's just a great way to go and and the thing I like about it is you know when I I started brewing I started brewing extract and and uh, when I had to do a uh, 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 all grain I almost had to replace all my equipment because it just wasn't mm -hmm. you know oh, I either my um, it didn't have the right size or that kind of thing. This is nice because if you know someday you want to go uh, all grain, you just get that lower boil kettle. And when you're ready to go all grain, you buy the upper mash ton and a little adapter lid and you're ready to go. And you can add the automation on right away or later. You know, so, so it's we, all modular to make too it, then, huh? Yeah, modular and in affordable chunks. But uh, it, it's been a, a great system. I love brewing on it. Um, the name really says it all. It's It's brew easy it's a it's a pretty neat setup in fact i think that you've got uh the profiles in beersmith now yeah i do you get you sent it it's uh it's available as an add-on so you just click on the add-on from the desktop you can uh, download right. that right into right into the program excellent excellent so it's, it's just a real simple it's just take all your water uh put it all in add your grains when you get up to temperature let it drain and boil away that's uh it's been a, a great system for us. Fantastic. Well, I noticed you guys have started doing uh, fermenters as well now. Uh, you got a conical fermenter out. I think it's called, let's see here, it's called the Ferminator, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. That was actually our one of our very first products. We've been mm -hmm. making those for, what, 14 years now, I think. And uh, that's that's been uh, a, a great product. In fact, that's kind of how I got into the uh, equipment business is I wanted to, to uh, uh, brew 10-gallon batches. There really wasn't any uh, commercially available equipment for doing 10-gallon batches. And I found a big Nalgene tank and uh, was using that. And, and I had a couple of contaminated batches from some scratches inside of it and a valve that wouldn't quite disassemble all the way. And and uh, I decided I wanted one of these stainless conical things and, and uh, went about uh, building a couple for myself. And uh, uh, they turned out really, uh, really well and talked to a local homebrew store. And they said, you know, you ought to consider selling these through the homebrew stores. And, uh, and that was down at Great Fermentations, my local homebrew store down in Indianapolis that I've been going to for years and years. And uh, that's how I got started. I started building conicals. And I just, I love using them. Uh, the, one of the things I really like is it's just seconds to get a, a wort sample. Uh, so I can see how the fermentation is progressing, uh, you know, can taste how things are going. Um, and then of course there's the yeast harvesting. Uh, that is just fantastic. If you're going to do subsequent batches with the same yeast, um, you can just get huge amount of, you know, virtually, uh, sediment free, uh, creamy yeast slurry. It's, so, I mean, why do, it, why do so many commercial brewers use the, the conical fermenters versus, uh, you know, carboys or, or a flat fermenter? Mm -hmm. They're also harvesting yeast, uh, which is, is a great way. Uh, they're easy to clean out. 
Um, most are unitank capable, meaning you can actually pressurize them, carbonate and dispense out of them. However, most um, people just move them to a, a bright beer tank for commercial applications. Um, but they're just, uh, you know, that, uh, that ability to uh, drain the sediment. You're, you're essentially, instead of racking the beer, you're racking the sediment. You know, so you can you can dump your trube and your yeast out of the bottom. That's particularly nice for lagering, um, where I can I can set that in my uh, freezer. I have an upright freezer that I keep my conicals in, and uh, I just uh, use that aluminum duct tape. Yet another purpose for duct tape. I, I thought you'd have a walk-in freezer or something like that. We do. We're we're <laughs> building one at at Blickman Labs. <laughs> But I don't think I'd get the walk-in freezer by my wife. Walk-in wine cooler, maybe, or uh, uh, yeah, the wine wine uh, storage, maybe. But uh, I just keep her, I just keep her stacked with uh, with hoppy IPAs, and and she's happy. So that's good. That's good. Yeah. So so, yeah. Uh, so what sizes do the fermenters come in? We have them in seven and a half, uh, fourteen and a half, uh, twenty-seven. And 42 and 60 and 80 gallons now. And we yeah. also just started with some extensions. So you can actually put an extension in your 14 and a half and make it a 25 gallon fermenter. So it's kind of modular. You can do 10 gallon and 20 gallon batches uh, with the same uh, uh, basic tank. Uh, which makes it modular. In fact, that's how we our our uh, 42 gallon and our 80 gallon our extensions on our 27. So it gives you that ability to grow with them if if you need to. So, we, you know, again, we try to make these things so you can, you know, increase your capacity in chunks and, uh, and just yeah. make them very fine tuned for the home brewer. I really like uh, the way that you don't have to move the word around and you got a much lower risk of, uh, of bacteria getting into it. You also got a much lower risk of aeration, which is a real problem for a lot of home brewers. Yes, it is. And it's, you know, it's kind of one of these things too, where if you're uh, busy, I've got three insanely busy daughters and you know, it's, ah, I'll rack it tomorrow. Well, I'll rack it tomorrow. And then before I know it, it's been three weeks in the primary and you can get yeast autolysis and, you know, with, with the conical, it's, you know, I'll be up in two minutes. I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I just got to uh, dump the yeast and, and dump the tube and it's, and it's done. You know, it, it's just minutes to, do that versus great you know, great it, way to harvest yeast too yes yes and reuse I, it you know i harvest yeast pretty frequently and and with the the price of yeast uh what it is it it adds up pretty quickly and you know if you're one that you you know you settle in on uh you know two or three different yeast types uh you can get these cultures in a homebrew environment with very little trouble you know three, four, five generations. And if, if you want to do a little bit of yeast washing, you know, you can, you know, go 10. Uh, so it's, it is pretty handy and you just get a tremendous amount of yeast and, you know, just some great, uh, second fermentations. Well, John, you got a whole bunch of other innovative products. Uh, one of my personal favorites is the beer gun. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk about maybe just a couple of your other, uh, smaller products. Uh, we've got, um, the, um, Hop Rocket is one of our newer products that uh, people are really like, and we get some good feedback on that. And it's an inline um, closed loop hop back. And uh, the thing I really like about it is um, you you come out of your fermenter into your, uh, or I'm sorry, out of your brew kettle into the Hop Rocket hop back. And you can either pump through it or you can gravity feed through it. And, uh, and then you go into a counter flow chiller and then into your fermenter. And what I uh, like about that is it, you pass your hot wort uh, through those hops, you pick up all the volatiles, and then you immediately chill it back down so that they don't evaporate on you like, uh, you know, like knockout hops. Mm -hmm. Even with knockout hops, you're still losing some of your volatiles. And then it goes right into the fermenter cold. So you maintain a lot more of those volatiles. Uh, it also does a great job filtering the beer as it goes through, uh, taking out a lot of the hop break. And um, you know other you know pellet hop particles and and the like. Uh, it's been a great product for us. And if you're interested in doing an electric rim system, uh, we've got a heater that actually inserts into the hop rocket canister. So uh, you get that extra versatility out of uh, the hop rocket by just putting it uh, that heating element inside of it. So that's one another product that I uh, love that I've been using for years is our uh, auto sparge. And it's uh, basically it's a, just a mechanical inline float 
uh, valve. So you can hook your hot liquor tank up to your mash tun, and uh, uh, it regulates the level. It uh, distributes the wort uh, in a just a slow, circular manner over the top of the mash uh, to keep it evenly distributed. Um, it's all stainless steel and, and silicone that, that touches your wort. And uh, uh, it it automatically follows whatever your drain rate is. So, if, you know, if you set it at a quarter gallon a minute out of your valve, the hot liquor flows in at that exact same rate. So you don't have to worry about uh, run, overflowing your mash tun or running it dry. Uh, that's, a, that's one of my favorite uh, uh, products that I've, I use every time I brew. Very cool. Um, well, what are you working on next, John? Oh, we've got some top secret things that we're working on. Some that are uh, some Classified. new updates. Classified. I I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you. And that that you know, killing your customer base is generally not uh, the most profitable. So, <laughs> but uh, we've uh, we've got some uh, new uh, updates to some of our existing products, and we've got uh, some brand new, uh, very exciting, revolutionary products that we're working on that uh, you'll see uh, in the months to come. You gonna launch so. some new ones at the at the homebrew conference next year? We hope to have a couple uh, new products that we'll uh, be bringing with us, but we're not going to wait for the show. When they're ready, we're going to bring them out for homebrewers. So. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, John, is there anything else you'd like to add? I, I'd just like to uh, uh, thank uh, you for these uh, informative sessions. They're, they're great to listen to. It, it really helps out the community and uh, also for making a great uh, uh, brewing software. So. Well, thank you, John. I appreciate what you do, too. I uh, really enjoy seeing you every year at the Homebrew Conference. And and also, I uh, really appreciate all the amazing equipment you put out. Oh, thank you much. It's been a, a labor of love. I'm, I'm homebrewer at heart. Uh, did my bat first batch in 1991. And, you, you were uh, telling me you got a pretty big facility now, too. Yeah, yeah. We moved into uh, an old Sears building that was built in the 50s. It's just built like a tank and uh, renovated it. It's in an uh, urban enterprise zone, so it was great to uh, fix something up that was kind of getting run down. And it's just a, it's been a great facility for us. Uh, we've got a lot more room to spread out for efficiency and bringing in new products. And uh, and it's uh, been a boon for the uh, our local uh, community, too, to have a, a building that's been restored. So. That's been fun. A lot of work, but fun. Well, thank you, John. I really appreciate you being on the show. Appreciate you having me, Brad. We'll have to do it again soon. Again, today my guest is John Blickman, the head of Blickman Engineering. They make some of the finest world-class homebrewing equipment in the world. You can find them online at BlickmanEngineering.com and in most of the major brewing retail stores. Well, a big thank you to John Blickman for joining us today. Thanks also to our sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine, now offering six issues a year at a 20% discount. Head on over to beerandbrewing.com and use the coupon code BEERSMITH when you check out to get your 20% discount on this great new brewing magazine. And also the American Homebrewers Association. This group does an amazing job for the entire brewing community. I encourage you to sign up or give a gift membership by going to homebrewersassociation.org slash membership today. If you click on the gift membership link, you can give a membership to a fellow brewer or also get a free book or my extract DVD as a gift for yourself. Finally, thank you for your continued support of Beersmith and thank you for listening. I hope you have a great brewing week. Mm -hmm.